me the opportunity to present some of the work that we do over here at the Center for Microscopy Characterization and Analysis at the University of Western Australia. Uh, I'm Diana Patalwala and I work as a research officer at CMCA, uh, UWA. And today I'm going to present to you a couple of projects that are taking place on uh, two of our in vivo preclinical imaging instruments over here at CMCA. So just before I uh, head into the actual talk itself, I would like to give a brief intro uh, about our center. We are basically located at a couple of sites within the University of Western Australia, but our bioimaging facility, which basically involves uh, the majority of our preclinical um, small animal imaging instruments, uh, is located at the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research at the QE2 Medical Center. Uh, we here uh, at the Center for Microscopy Characterization and Analysis are the West Australian node for the National Imaging Facility, which has multiple nodes across Australia. So we are located over here in Perth. Our bioimaging facility basically uh, includes a 9.40 small animal preclinical MRI, an in vivo small animal and materials imaging micro CT, which I'm going to talk about today an in vivo bioluminescence imaging uh, scanner, which is the IBIS Lumina 2, an in vivo multispectral fluorescence imaging instrument, which I'm going to talk about as well today. Uh, we also have the Visual Sonics, uh, Fujifilm Visual Sonics uh, Vivo Laser X, which is the high frequency in vivo ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging instruments. And we are soon to receive a large field of view CT, which would be dedicated for materials imaging hopefully by the start of next year. And we are also expanding in the human uh, research uh, space with a human MRI and PET-CT scanner due to arrive uh, soon next year. So starting with my talk, um, the very first instrument that I'm gonna talk about today is our Brooker Skyscan 1176 micro CT scanner. It's an in vivo preclinical scanner for mice, rats. That's the scanner over there. You can see it's with the acquisition workstation and the anesthetic trolley. We generally use isofluorine anesthetic gas for our mild plane of anesthesia. That over there, uh, as you can see, is our rat imaging bed and the maximum bore size on this instrument is about 6.8 centimeters. So we can't put in anything beyond 6 point, wider than 6.8 centimeters. I'm saying this because we do a lot of ex vivo and materials imaging on this instrument as well, along with in vivo scanning. So at the moment, we are kind of limited with the field of view about 6.8 centimeters, and hence we'll be venturing into the large field of view CT space soon. Uh, over here, you can see a mouse uh, imaging dedicated uh, bed, which has its own anesthetic line and pressure sensing uh, lines. Now, we basically monitor the breathing rate on this instrument via two methods. Uh, we've got the pressure sensing method, uh, which we make use of a pneumatic pressure sensing pillow over here. To, uh, it's just kept below the abdomen of the animal and it detects the breathing rate of the animal. The other method by which we detect the breathing rate is a video monitoring method, which is basically we put a piece, a small piece of polystyrofoam uh, on the chest of the animal and we draw a small square on one of the boundaries of uh, the polystyrofoam piece. And basically the movement of the polystyrene piece within that square uh, is picked up by the software and it's proportional to the breathing of the animal as it's kept right on the chest of the animal. So we do make use of the video monitoring method for uh, monitoring the breathing rate as well. Now, as you can see uh, in the scanner over here, uh, as it's a live animal in vivo scanner, the animals have to be stationary. Uh, just a moment. Um, getting a bit of a trouble. Gleb, are you, I'm so sorry. Gleb, are you able to invite people through because there are people waiting? Uh, yes, so I was there admitted now. Perfect, thank you so much. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll just continue with my presentation. Um, so there you go. The in vivo scanner, we've got the animal bed, animal stays stationary. 
the X-ray source and the detector assembly rotate or 360 degrees round the animal bed, basically. So we are taking multiple raw projections as a at a specified rotation step uh, while doing a 360 degree round rotation around the animal. Uh, this Brooker Skyscan 1176 micro CT has three standard isotropic resolutions that uh, they offer. 9 micron, 18 micron, and 35 micron. And the maximum voltage available on our system is about 90 kilovolts of X-ray energy. So the majority of in vivo work that we do on our scanner is involving lung volume imaging. As you can see, these are the raw projections of the animal. When we put these raw projections in a reconstruction software, we get 2D transaxial slices throughout the entire volume. And when we put these uh, into an analysis software, segment them out, we get the binarized information, which we then put into a 3D volume rendering software to get 3D volumes. Uh, most of the in vivo stuff over here involves lung volume imaging and wide adipose tissue imaging, uh, subcutaneous wide adipose tissue imaging, visceral subcutaneous uh, uh, wide adipose tissue imaging. Uh, and uh, for the, as far as the ex vivo stuff is con uh, concerned, it's heavily dominated by uh, bone imaging. There's a lot of bone imaging happening uh, over here along with the uh, external contrast uh, injected placental imaging. Uh, of rodents. So these are some of the examples of the stuff that's taking place on our scanner at the moment, along with, of course, the varied other applications that the instrument has to offer. So the very first project that I'm going to talk about today is um, a group uh, from Curtin University who are studying the chronic intake of energy drinks and their sugar-free substitution uh, similarly promoting metabolic syndrome. So what is metabolic syndrome basically? It's a collection of conditions that often come together and increase your risk of diabetes, uh, stroke and heart disease. Uh, the main components or symptoms of metabolic syndrome would include obesity, high blood pressure, high blood triglycerides, insulin resistance and so on. Why energy drinks? Well, energy drinks contain a significant quantity of caffeine, taurine, and sugar, and are increasingly consumed by our population of adolescents and young adults these days. So the putative effects of the chronic ingestion of uh, the energy drinks and their sugar-free substitutions on metabolic syndrome were determined in wild type, that is C57BL6 mice, uh, after 13 weeks of intervention. So there were six groups of uh, randomly assigned uh, mice. The first group was kept on control, that was water plus standard maintenance chow. The second group was kept on standard energy drink diet. The third group was kept on sugar-free energy drink. Uh, there was the fourth group on soft drinks. There was another group on diet enriched just in saturated fatty acid. And the last group was kept on a combined diet of saturated fatty acid plus uh, energy drinks. So they observed, some of the observations that they made were Mice treated with uh, energy drinks were hyperglycemic and uh, hypertriglyceridemic, indicating high triglyceride glucose index as compared to the control mice and as compared to the mice that were kept on uh, soft drinks as well, the SD. Surprisingly, the mice maintained on sugar-free energy drinks, which was the SFED over here, um, showed signs of insulin resistance, hypertriglyceridemia, and greater triglyceride glucose index comparable to the energy drink group. For well, the mice maintained on saturated fatty acid uh, diet, whilst blood glucose and triglyceride concentrations remained comparable to the control mice, they exhibited significantly greater weight gain. Uh, body fat, cholesterol, 
uh, and insulin as compared to the control mice. And this is where basically our SkyScan micro CT comes into play. They uh, quantified the white adipose tissue values over here using our in vivo preclinical CT scanner. In addition, the energy drink uh, mice had greater adiposity, white adipose tissue, uh, primarily due to the increase in white adipose tissue, although the body weight was comparable to the control mice receiving only water. So the acquisition settings for this study uh, involved, of course, we use the isoflurane anesthetic gas for the mild plane of anesthesia, supplied at 2% with mixed with 1.0 to 0 0.8 liters per minute of oxygen flow. Uh, the voltage that we used for scanning was around 40 kilovolts of extra energy with an aluminum 1 mm thick filter. And the image pixel size was 35 microns. We wanted a quick scan because it's in vivo scanner scanning. We want to reduce the X-ray dosage. So images were acquired at a rotation step of 0 0.6 degrees, which means that at every 0 0.6 degrees, the X-ray source and the detector assembly stopped, took two images because the averaging was set at two and it averages out and gives us a single image at the end of it, which increases the scanning time, but helps us uh, reduce noise in the images. And this was done over the entire 360 degree turn. The reconstruction settings, we used Brooker's NRECON proprietary reconstruction software called NRECON. And you can see the reconstruction uh, settings mentioned over here, uh, ring artifact reduction, beam hardening correction. These are very common uh, artifacts that we usually observe with laboratory X-ray sources. The X-ray attenuation values as mentioned over here. Now, the important bit to note uh, in this protocol is this Brooker SkyScan 1176 does offer gating techniques. It does offer prospective and retrospective gating techniques, but it does that only for a subscan. So if we are interested in a small area of an animal, say for example, lung imaging, where we are just interested in the lungs, we can apply those gating techniques and get uh, data which is free of breathing artifacts. But if we want to image the whole animal as is seen over here, which includes multiple subscans, we unfortunately can't apply those gating techniques. So it's very important to get a breathing rate which kind of keeps the animal physiologically stable and uh, gives us breathing artifact-free images. So over here, we settled for a 36 to 48 breaths per minute breathing rate. And as you can see, we've acquired images which are pretty much free of any breathing artifacts. So it's... Uh, Worth to mention over here that there was no gating involved in uh, this imaging protocol. And the X-ray dosage that the animal received was about 493 milligrays, which is again calculated by a uh, broker proprietary software that comes along with the scan. With the CT analysis methodology, the white adipose tissue, specifically the white adipose tissue analysis, we use the broker CTN uh, software, CT analysis software. So the way we started with the analysis was, first of all, the uh, X-ray attenuation values for the lungs is pretty much similar to the white adipose tissue that you'll see in a moment. So to improve or kind of quicken the analysis, we manually, um, drew an ROI around the lungs and had that saved on the clipboard. With the actual data set, we started with binarizing the whole animal body and removing all the small tiny speckles within the animal body, creating a white solid 3D object in the field of view, got rid of all the additional speckles in and around the animal body. And then we performed a morphological operation of erosion to slightly, uh, by a few pixels, to get rid of the animal skin so that we weren't including the animal skin within our analysis. And uh, once we did that, we copied that to a second clipboard and basically reloaded our actual uh, grayscale data set and thresholded it for white adipose tissue. And then we performed a couple of uh, bitwise operations for uh, 
called AND, which basically picks up white pixels which are present in both the image and the clipboard. The clipboard that I'm referring to has uh, basically the animal body uh, thresholded, the white solid object. So we are just looking within that area and nothing outside that area. And the final uh, bitwise operation that we did was that of subtraction. So we basically subtracted the clipboard ROI lung saved from the thresholded um, white adipose tissue image, which basically got rid of the lung area within the white adipose tissue within the animal body. And now we were just looking at the white adipose tissue um, binarized data. So we could do 3D analysis on this and get white adipose tissue volume, percentage, thickness distribution, and so on and so forth. Now, the interesting bit that we came across during the analysis of this data set was that we are able to um, start this. So we are basically able to uh, observe and segment out brown adipose tissue, which is found in the interscapular area of the animal body near the neck. And uh, we did not expect to see the brown adipose tissue uh, in our CT images without any external contrast agents, but we did manage to, and then the group decided that they'll go forward and uh, quantify it as well. So we had a similar approach. We drew a manual ROI around the interscapular brown adipose tissue or bat, like we call it. And uh, we segmented out uh, the brown adipose tissue therein and performed a bitwise operation and which is basically selecting pixels which are present in both the region of interest that we manually drew and the image that's segmented. So we are just picking up pixels, the brown adipose tissue pixels within the region of interest that we selected. So as you can see in this uh, 3D volume rendering that we um, created using the CTWOX volume rendering software, again, it's from Brooker. You can see the brown adipose tissue and the white adipose tissue uh, across the entire animal. At the top, you could see the subcutaneous, uh, on the boundaries, basically, you could see the subcutaneous white adipose tissue, and you can see the visceral adipose tissue in, in the lower abdomen, lower half of the animal as well. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it from uh, this project. Now, moving on to one of the other projects, industry-sponsored projects that we've had on the SkyScan CD scanner. This was sponsored by Orthocell. So Professor Minghao Zeng, he's the co-founder of Orthocell. He's a UW, uh, UWA academic as well. And his group has been using our micro CD scanner to compare the performance of one of their collagen membranes that they've come up with called CellGrow. And they're comparing its performance against one of their competitor products, which is the BioGuide. Uh, for the repair of bone defects via guided bone regeneration, or GBR, as I'll refer to it from now on. And this was an ex vivo study, which was done in the mandible of canines. So what is guided bone regeneration? Usually guided bone regeneration is performed following the loss or extraction of uh, teeth as far as we are looking at the dental applications. Without intervention, the site, the defect site, will be characterized by the invasion of the gingival tissue or the gums, and there will be loss of bone through resorption. Now, in order to prevent this, we have the GBR, the guided bone regeneration uh, technology. So there's an implant is placed in the defect site in the available bone and any remaining defect space within that area is filled up with granulated bone mineral um, material before a collagen membrane, in this case, uh, the cell grow and the bio guide, they are, they are placed on the top of the defect and the gingival tissue is sutured and the repair site is closed. So this uh, cell grow membrane basically uh, does not allow the gingival tissue to enter the defect space and allows the bone to regrow without any further interference from the gingival tissue. So to give you a brief overview, here's a histology slide that uh, they have provided us. Uh, and you can see that that's the metal implant over there. 
And right at the top, if you zoom in into this area, you'll be able to see the collagen membrane and uh, the gingival tissue and the new formation, the new bone that's forming up. Now, our CD scanner was basically analyzed or used, or was basically used to analyze the regrowth or the development of new bone around this metal implant. So this was an ex vivo study uh, and it was done in the mandible and maxilla of canines. We used a, a thick filter, copper 0.1 mm thick filter at 90 kilovolts of X-ray energy, which is the maximum that's offered on our instrument. We need to do this because we've got a metal implant in our field of view. So we need high X-ray energy and a thick filter to reduce the beam hardening effect, which is basically a whitish blur that we see when uh, the X-rays at, at the intersection of the bone and uh, metal implant interface cause x-rays attenuate quite a bit when they hit the metal. So we need to use a good filter, which uh, can ignore all the low energy x-rays and allows only the 90 kilovolts x-ray energy to pass through it and hit our sample with that. So the image pixel size in this case was nine micron. It was an ex vivo study. So we went for the highest possible resolution as uh, scanning time wasn't an issue. Rotation step was 0 0.4 degrees, so projections were collected at every 0 0.4 degrees with an averaging of two over an entire 360-degree turn. Uh, Brooker's Enricon software, which uses the Feldkem cone bean uh, reconstruction algorithm, was used for reconstruction. The reconstruction settings are mentioned over here, and what I would like to specifically mention was uh, we've used an advanced beam hardening correction in this case, which is the fifth order polynomial correction, which we need to use in case we have a metal implant in our field of view. In case of imaging metals where the X-rays attenuate tremendously and the beam hardening uh, occurs to quite some extent, we, knew we need an advanced beam hardening correction to kind of correct that beam hardening, those beam hardening effects. The scan duration for this was about, for each of these uh, samples was about one hour and 15 minutes. And you can see uh, the, our sample over here with the bone and the metal implant in all the three planes. Now the analysis strategy for uh, this uh, project was basically we first of all needed to determine our volume of interest. Uh, how much area, how many slices are we going to analyze? And we needed to be consistent uh, with this across the entire study. So what they did was they uh, determined a reference slice, which would be the top of the implant. And having an offset of about 225 slices, they started their region of interest thereafter. And it extended for about 400 slices, which is about 3.55 mm. So they kind of stayed consistent with this protocol and we made sure that the volume of interest is cons consistent across the entire study. Okay, so once the volume of interest was determined, uh, they wanted to do 3D analysis as well as 2D analysis. So to begin with the 3D analysis, uh, which would give us parameters such as total bone volume, bone volume percentage, trabecular thickness, separation, trabecular number. And all these values are pretty routine values that are uh, considered for bone regrowth or bone study, uh, especially for micro CT study. So you get all these values with the help, with the help of 3D analysis plugin. So we started with binarizing the implant, first of all, and uh, removing any pores within the implant, creating one solid 3D object uh, within our field of view. Then we performed a dilation step, a morphological operation of dilation to include a little bit of uh, beam hardening uh, artifact that might still be going on in spite of our beam, advanced beam hardening correction. There'll always be a little bit of beam hardening happening because of the metal implant. And we don't want to analyze our bone within that beam hardening area. So we performed a, a little, um, a few radius uh, pixels uh, dilation operation, followed by another one, which would give us the outer extent of our volume of interest. 
for studying the bone around our metal. So we basically performed a subtraction of the two dilation operations that we had, and we end up getting our a volume of interest, which is the area around the metal implant that we are interested in studying. We binarize it and perform the 3D analysis plugin on this one to get the total bone volume, bone volume percentage, trabecular thickness, and so on and so forth. So perhaps you end up seeing, so that's the bone metal, uh, the metal implant getting binarized and we've calculated the VOI around the volume of interest around the implant and soon it will be segmented and we'll be able to see the black and white pixels around it. There you go. And we perform our 3D analysis on, on that VOI. And that's a 3D volume rendering of the bone, uh, the bone regrowth around the metal implant. Again, created in CT Vox. So that was the 3D analysis for the bone volume, the bone regrowth. Uh, what they also were interested in was a parameter called bone implant contact, which is defined by uh, intersection surface in CTN, and it's basically a 2D parameter. So they basically want to study what that bone implant contact is or the intersection surface is. And what they mean by intersection surface is uh, if you were to travel around your region of interest perimeter, pixel by pixel, how many perimeter pixels would be in contact with the binarized bone relative to the number coming in contact with the black space? So this intersection surface can be expressed um, as a perimeter if it's a single cross section. It can be expressed in terms of area if there are multiple cross sections and it can be expressed uh, as a percentage as well. So the analysis strategy was pretty much similar to the 3D analysis protocol, basically binarizing the metal implant, removing all the pores therein, performing the first dilation to include uh, all the beam hardening effects to account for all the beam hardening effects. So we are not analyzing the bone within those areas and uh, saving that within a separate clipboard area. We reloaded our grayscale data, thresholded the bone this time rather than the metal implant. And then we performed an addition, a bitwise operation of addition to combine all the pixels, which all the white pixels, which are common with the, with the dilated mask and the bone thresholded image. And those white pixels are basically defined by this blue bone over here. So this gives us our intersection surface in 2D. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for the projects that I wanted to talk about in regards to our in vivo preclinical micro CT scanner. Now coming to our in vivo multispectral fluorescence imaging system, the CRI Maestro 2, that's the system over there, that's the imaging chamber. And within the imaging chamber, you can see the animal stage. It's a heated animal stage. Uh, with three nose cones, so we can simultaneously image three mice or a single rat. And it's got its uh, dedicated um, anesthetic and scavenge system. So the anesthetic gas is supplied and the scavenge gas is taken out and it's, uh, that's, that's the imaging chamber in there. In regards to the system, the setup of the system, it's a trans illumination system. What I mean by trans illumination is uh, the excitation light source is at the bottom over here and the excitation light passes through and through the animal and gets detected by the CCD cooled camera at the top of the animal. So the excitation light in this case is traveling through and through the animal, which provides us greater sensitivity for deep tissue imaging. As opposed to epi illumination, which is basically having the excitation and the emission um, source or emission detector on the same side of the animal. So this is a highly sensitive in vivo fluorescence imaging system for deep tissue imaging. And basically we use fluorescent probes, labels, dyes, inject them in the animal and track them over a period of time in vivo. We do a lot of ex vivo organ imaging as well on this system. So um, in regards to the fluorescent probes, uh, we've got activatable fluorescent probes, 
which are optically silent upon injection, but get activated in vivo through cleavage by specific protease biomarkers of disease. These probes are basically designed to target and read out uh, disease-related molecular activities with high signal-to-noise ratio at the biological target. The targeted uh, in vivo imaging fluorescent probes are optimized uh, to actively target and bind specific biomarkers, and they're designed to target uh, key biologies such as cell surface receptor, upregulation, or bone turnover. Uh, and they accumulate at the local site with high specificity. The Perkin Elmer's vascular and physiological agents are a range of highly fluorescent uh, in vivo imaging molecules designed to remain highly stable and localized in the anatomy for various periods of time, uh, basically enabling us to image uh, disease physiology, vasculature, vascular permeability, angiogenesis, and so on. And uh, we've got uh, Perkin Elmer's fluorescent dyes for labeling antibodies, small molecules, proteins, peptides, uh, which uh, are also suitable for imaging uh, within RCRI Maestro 2 fluorescence imaging system. So the first project, uh, oh, actually, before we move on to that, um, the process by which we um, analyze, acquire and analyze the data on the maestro is it's a three-step process. The first process is uh, image acquisition. So what we do is we acquire an image cube. What I mean by an image cube is it acquires a series of images uh, within a decided, uh, pre-decided wavelength range. Say for example, from 500 nanometers to about 950 nanometers, it takes multiple images with a step size, with a predefined step size of 10 nanometers or five nanometers, we can predefine that step size. And all of these images collected within the defined wavelength range make up an image cube, what we call an image cube. This image cube, we then use this image cube to unmix our uh, desired signal, our fluorescent probe signal. There are specialized uh, algorithms provided by the software to uh, unmix our pure fluorescent probe signal from the autofluorescence. Now, autofluorescence plays a major role in this kind of in vivo fluorescence imaging. We've got fluorescence, uh, autofluorescence coming from the food that the mice eat, so we have to put them on a known fluorescing diet for two weeks prior to the imaging. Uh, there's uh, autofluorescence coming from the hair, so we have to shave the hair or, or preferably use nude mice. Uh, there's uh, or skin autofluorescence, so we need to have a control animal wherein we can draw our spectral autofluorescence spectral library on that control animal. So that basically that control spectral library for autofluorescence spectral uh, um, curve, that can be applied to the rest of the study animals. So we can draw our um, mixed fluorescent probe signal, the signal that's mixed with autofluorescence, and subtract it from our pure autofluorescence spectral curve, and what we get is our pure fluorescent probe signal over here, which we unmix and then quantify using regions of interest. So the very first project that I'm going to talk about that makes use of our CRI Maestro is assessing the delivery and biodistribution of a peptide derived against the alpha interaction domain of the cardiac L-type calcium channel which is basically the AID peptide. Now, uh, what this group has is they're working with a murine model of uh, cardiac troponin-1 mutation. Now, this mutation is associated with increased mitochondrial activity, which ultimately results in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the aim over here is to restore this mitochondrial activity before it results in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And they do that uh, with the help of a treatment which involves the uh, aid tag peptide, which is targeted at the heart. Now, they're, they're tracking this treatment by a variety of techniques. They've got targeted metabolomics, uh, which is used to evaluate myocardial substrate, substrate metabolism. They've got uh, cardiac myocyte mitochondrial metabolic activity assessing uh, uh, with, uh, in terms of alterations in mitochondrial membrane potential, flavoprotein, flavoprotein oxidation. They've got cardiac morphology and function being examined with the help of echocardiography. 
Now, where the maestro comes in use is basically they are using the maestro to assess the in vivo cardiac uptake of this eight dead peptide, which is targeted at heart. So we've got uh, eight TAD targeted at heart, and which we basically call the active peptide, and we've got a scrambled peptide, which is not specifically targeted at heart, and they are comparing the in vivo cardiac uptake of this. Now, this eight TAD peptide is basically tagged with a Psi7 uh, probe, and we are tracking this with the help of our CRI Maestro 2 in vivo imaging system. So basically, they are collecting images between uh, 900, 700 and 900 nanometer wavelength range with a step size of five nanometers. So this image getting collected at 700 nanometers, 705, 710, so on and so forth till about 900 nanometers. And we collect our image cube, we uh, unmix it, we have our autofluorescent spectral library and our mixed uh, curve. We subtract the two and we get a pure size seven signal. And we quantify this Psi 7 signal. If I were to show you, uh, so if you can see in this video over here, you can see the Psi 7 uh, 8 TAD targeted to the heart, flickering in the video away, and you can see it's targeted at the heart and taken up by the heart. So, some of the in vivo ex vivo findings involve. Uh, maximum cardiac uptake of the targeted 8TAT size 7 was achieved one hour post injection, and it remained significantly higher for up till about four hours post injection as compared to the scrambled peptide. At four hours, uh, the hearts were extracted and ex vivo uh, size 7 fluorescent signal was assessed. And it was consistent with the in vivo findings in that uh, the 8TAT size 7 fluorescence for the targeted peptide was significantly higher as compared to the scrambled peptide. The biodistribution findings include that the 8TAT Psi7 uptake was significantly greater in the active targeted heart as opposed to the scrambled peptide. There was no significant uptake in uh, the kidney, liver, and bladder. And these data basically indicate that the 8TAT was rapidly taken up by the heart uh, versus uh, the scrambled heart of the active, actively targeted peptide as opposed to the scrambled peptide and is not retained by the kidneys, liver, or bladder, uh, sorry, kidneys or liver when administered in vivo. The last project that I'm going to talk about uh, is it's, it's a work in progress at the moment, and I'm not allowed to divulge a lot of information in relation to this, but I specifically wanted to present this as a proof of concept of what we can do with the help of the system, the CRI Maestro. So what we have here is a study um, involving fluorescent labeling of a biomaterial, and they are studying the degradation rate of this biomaterial over a period of time. Basically, they're going to use this biomaterial um, as a medium to release drug over a period of time. So they have, at the moment, uh, fluorescently labeled the biomaterial with size 7. Eventually, they are, and they have already, but uh, I'm not allowed to show that data. They have even labeled the drug with size 7. And they are basically studying the in vivo degradation of these uh, in vivo over a period of time. The idea is that the biomaterial uh, has to degrade uh, in, within a specific period of time, and the drug has to release within a specific period of time to, for it to be effective. So as you can see over here, uh, the top panel is basically the size 7 labeled biomaterial. The lower row is basically the size 7 biomaterial with the drug. The drug is not labeled with size 7 in this case. The biomaterial is labeled with size 7 in both of these rows. But it just goes to show that the drug has no effect on the degradation rate of the biomaterial over here. So similarly, they performed the same process. They collected an image cube. We had our autofluorescence uh, spectral library drawn on a control animal. And then we had the size 7 spectral library drawn on our study animals. The compute pure spectrum algorithm was used and we end up getting a pure uh, size 7 signal, which was basically picked up within, which was picked up in vivo 
at the site of uh, the biomaterial. So that is pretty much it as far as the two instruments that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I would just like to take this opportunity to mention that we are venturing into the materials imaging space uh, with a large field of view CT um, soon to arrive uh, by the start of next year, hopefully. It's the Nikon's XTH 2 to 5 ST CT, which is, uh, belongs to its industrial CT range. And we'll now have the capability to image samples as large as 35 centimeters by 35 by 35 centimeters thick and weighing up to about 50 kg. So we've got uh, a high power X-ray. We've got multiple uh, trans uh, transmission target, reflection target, rotating targets. But I'd like to stress that we've got, we'll, we'll be having the only rotating target available in Australia, powered at 450 watts, which would really enable us to venture into the metal uh, imaging space um, and additive manufacturing uh, space. So we are planning to image implants, prostheses, uh, additive manufactured prostheses, uh, metals, um, archeological specimens, museum specimens, coral specimens. So we are basically trying to target uh, large specimens with this CT. We are also um, going to, we are soon going to receive the human uh, research dedicated MRI and PET CT uh, in 2022. So yes, we are expanding. And I would finally like to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, all our researchers who've uh, gladly agreed for me to present their data, CMCA, NIF, and Global Bioimaging for providing me with an opportunity to give you a brief overview of the stuff that we do over here at CMCA. So oh, thank you, that's all from my end.